Now, if you haven't seen our video on this motherboard, do go check that out. The link is in the description. The E3V5WS is a C232 motherboard, and you want to know all about the motherboard, just go to the link in the description. Are you looking for a reprieve from the RGB madness? Yes? Well, I've got a build for you. Why don't you tell them what you're looking for, Grizzle? Well, I'm looking for something to replace my i7-920. And I want to use it for Linux development, but also it might be a server at some point. And I'm really, I'm looking for something kind of bare bones. I, need, I don't need a lot of bells and whistles. So we were chatting earlier and what you're looking for is basically no nonsense. I was showing you some of the new stuff with this generation and RGB controller this and, you know, lighting controller that and those things were, were kind of a turn off. And so we decided we're going to do a build video with the ASRock E3 V5 WS. Why the E3 V5 WS? Well, it supports Skylake Xeon, you know, socket 1151 but it's the C232 chipset. So this is not a desktop chipset like the Z170 or, or the H170 for business class machines. This is a server grade CPU and this motherboard definitely qualifies as not having any bells and whistles. Yeah, so I looked at that board earlier and for workstation use, I think it's pretty much what I'm looking for. Okay, so the whole story with this is that Intel's gotten kind of weird in this generation. Uh, the desktop boards, they're kind of trying to segment uh, the desktop boards from like the server grade boards and this is sort of, you know, low end server country. The, the, the middle of the road server country is really the Xeon E5, you know, 40 PCI Express lanes and a lot of connectivity and tons of peripherals and things like that. But, you know, from the use case that you and I were discussing earlier, this is a really good uh, sort of developer Linux workstation, things like that with, with no bells and whistles. So even though this motherboard doesn't have M.2 or SATA Express or anything like that, it doesn't really matter. The second by 16 physical slot is wired uh, with PCI Express by four through the DMI. That slot is designed for like the Intel, NVMe, PCI Express, SSD. You can also use an M.2 uh, with a PCI Express adapter. Those are really, really inexpensive. And you can use those through this slot. There's full UEFI support for those peripherals, so you're not gonna have any problems using those peripherals. Now, the thing that sets this, this board apart from other boards is that it's also the C232 chipset. That is a true server grade chipset. There are uh, you know, other vendors uh, producing motherboards that are workstation class, but they're still using the Z170 chipset or the H170 or other desktop grade chipsets. This is really a no frills motherboard. There's not, there's not even one M.2 slot, you know, no NVMe. This is really just a solid no frills workstation motherboard that works pretty well with Linux. Now, you mentioned M.2 to PCIe adapter. Am I gonna run into any kind of weird boot problems with that? No, because the motherboard actually has full support for those peripherals. It just doesn't provide the interface for it because normally uh, the motherboard would sort of share resources with the, the DMI 3.0 interface. And so you end up in a situation where, you know, you've got the M.2 slot or you've got the PCI Express slot. Or if you put the M.2 in, it'll disable the PCI Express slot. ASRock has eschewed all of that because, I mean, you're not really going to use that anyway. If you're going to run an M.2, then get an M.2 to PCI Express adapter. But I think my recommendation for you for your workstation is to just get the PCI Express Intel NVMe. That works great on this motherboard. In terms of connectivity for other peripherals, you've also got three other PCI Express by one interfaces. And then you've got the Elna audio, which is just, you know, your, your basic uh, Realtek, you know, 862 chipset, nothing, nothing fancy for your built-in audio. No need for extra audio. As long as I can listen to podcasts while I program, it's perfect. And uh, I think this will make a great Linux box for me to hack around on. And one of the reasons I was interested in it, I'm not gonna lie to you, is because I noticed that you have one. So why don't we build a system and while we're at it, you know, the, uh, the streaming computer has really been aging poorly lately. We've been having a lot of graphics driver crashes, <laughs> and a lot of problems there. Hmm. So we could see how this works to replace that. <laughs> All right. So what you propose is that we, uh, we re rebuild Peep Prime, our streaming computer, uh, which is currently based on a garbage uh, Dell i5, i5-2400, I think. <laughs> a Dell i5. Let's rebuild that with the uh, Xeon 1230 V5, and then we'll see how that's gonna work for you for your workstation. I, I like this, I like this plan. Let's, let's, set, let's set this plan into action. Now when we do this for real, when we do this for your workstation, we probably should pick up an RX 480, uh, since those just came out, and that's pretty much the perfect pairing with this motherboard and what we're doing. But for right now, let's use a Radeon 5750 that we've got laying around. Yeah, I've also got a deep cool 750 watt power supply and an old MSATA 2.5 SSD that we can use just for this test. 
Okay, yeah, this is gonna be a really simple build with the deep cool on the bench, I think. This is gonna work out pretty well. I've also got that Intel NVMe SSD we can test with immediately. Now, I did some testing for the motherboard review video for this. If you haven't seen that, you should check that out on the Tech Syndicate Hardware channel. But we've got enough stuff to build this thing to actually test it out. So we'll just do it on your test bench. All right, let's do it. All right, check it out, our old stream computer. It's a Dell Optiplex, it's an i5 with four gigs of RAM. And it does struggle sometimes dealing with three or four 1080p, 1920 by 1080p streams. You know, we're talking three, four, five megabit per stream. It's gonna remix that, it's gonna send it out to a couple of different things. We've also got a streaming server out on the internet that's basically the same setup, except it's out on the internet so that we can play games with people all over the internet, all over the world, you know, when we're traveling, things like that. Uh, you know, it's. I was sort of curious how the performance would be on this. You know, how has that actually worked out? Because you've had a chance to play with this now for a little bit. Well, I'm really impressed by it because, you know, on paper, the IPC gains are not huge between that i5 and this Xeon. But somehow, it must be the clock speed or the turbos. There's a real difference in performance here. It's noticeable. I think also for dev workloads, uh, doing things like deploys with Vagrant and uh, you know running virtual machines and things like that is also going to feel a lot snappier, especially if your main drive is going to be, be a PCI Express NVMe. I mean, it almost seems like a crime to use it to try to use a PCI Express storage on something like an i5-2400 if it even worked. So it's looking like this thing's actually going to work out pretty well for a workstation for you as well. Um, and you're going to use the SATA ports in your workstation for bulk storage as well through, through uh, mechanical hard drives. Yeah, I've got three six terabyte drives in a ZFS pool, and I'm probably going to self-host stuff on my own domain using the guide we've been working on with this machine. Oh yes, the audience gets to learn about the, the guides that we've been working on for the Linux channel and otherwise. Basically what we're going to do is uh, show you guys how to self-host a lot of stuff even on your own internet connection or maybe with servers out on the internet. There's a lot of options there, and uh, we've both gotten kind of excited about the whole containerization thing and some other stuff like that. Uh, that'll probably be running in containers in the background, right? Yeah, definitely going to look into the containers. Now, as stellar as this board is for this purpose, it pretty much, you know, hit all the points. But we do need to talk about the ACPI table problem. Oh yeah, that's right. So when we set up this board, uh, we've been sort of messing with this over the last week or so and through the, the movie Magic. Uh, we're just cutting it together so it seems like we're doing this in, in five minutes. But when we first built this, we actually had some problems with the ACPI tables in Linux. Uh, it would produce uh, error messages and basically filled up the disk with uh, ACPI errors and error logs. But we emailed ASRock and they sent us a replacement UEFI for this board that resolved all of the problems on Linux for us. So that was, that was pretty cool. Yeah, it just goes to show you that you always update the UEFI before you do anything else. And after that update, the Linux support on the board uh, was fine, it's flawless. And uh, the Intel NIC is really nice. Oh yeah, it's got the Intel server grade NIC because it's, you know, Xeon. Yeah, I was really impressed with this board when I reviewed it for the hardware channel. It doesn't have any bells and whistles. There's, there's really no extra features, but I think it's a really good value um, for getting work done. This general board would also make a great starting point for all kinds of machines. I don't know if I'd recommend it for a gaming computer, but it is a no-nonsense, no-frills motherboard. So I really like that part of it. Well, if, if you've got one of these or you're thinking about getting one of these, let us know. We'll be curious to see what you guys build with one of these. Uh, let us know in the forums over at techsyndicate.com. I'm Wendell. And I'm Grizz. And we will see you in the forum. Mm -hmm.